House of the Dying Sun gives an addictive and accessible combination of fast-paced space shooting along with tactical real-time strategic combat. It was released in November 2016 to critical acclaim but rarely is it mentioned in general discussions today. I wanted to revisit this forgotten classic to see if it still holds up in 2021. So let's take a look. Immersed Robot Hello everyone, welcome to Immerse Robot again. So in this video I wanted to take another look at House of the Dying Sun. This is a game that was released back in 2016 by Marauder Interactive and it's a game that can be played in VR or on a monitor so it's got the flat game version as well but it did have VR support on its release and I do remember playing it back then, back on the launch really and it was, I believe it was released in early access although don't hold me to that, I can't remember uh, entirely but I've not played it for a couple of years now so I wanted to go back and have another quick look at it just to see if it holds up now because I remember this as being a fantastic game back in the early days of VR and uh, there wasn't really too much else like it back then. So this game can be played with a gamepad or if you're playing on a monitor then you can play with a mouse and keyboard as well although I'm really talking about the VR version here anyway um, and so I used a gamepad. You can use a HOTAS, it is possible to use HOTAS although the developer does say it's technically not supported so you use it at your own risk really but it does work it works fine people do set up a hotas to work with this game as well um but it's been a while since i played it and i wiped my save completely clear just for this playthrough and i set up a gamepad just to play with it because the tutorial is really focused around gamepad play so in order to familiarize myself with the controls again i decided just to play it with a gamepad for the purposes of this video so the game is split up into distinct levels as you play through a campaign Pain. and that's the main focus of the game although you can also play these challenges which are sort of procedurally generated missions uh, that change you know sort of on a daily basis so you can play through these missions as well and it provides a bit of ongoing gameplay after you've finished the campaign so as you progress through the game you'll get upgrades new weapons new equipment you can expand your fleet as well and now there is a basic narrative with this game as well um, there is some lore hinted at throughout the campaign campaign but basically the emperor of an imperial army that you play a part of has been killed and you're sent out on a variety of missions to destroy the traitors who arranged his murder now the first thing to say about this game is it's got quite an interesting mix of sort of first person cockpit based shooting and it's also mixed with uh, sort of strategic gameplay elements as well so when you first arrive in each level by default you're presented with sort of an a tactical overview of the level of the play arena and you can move and zoom around uh, the play field focusing on any ships that you want a little bit more detail on and within this area you can also give initial orders to the ships which in your fleet now the thing that really separates this game is that you can then jump into any of the ships that are under your command take control of them and then you know it basically acts like a eve valkyrie kind of game then a, a single player eve valkyrie kind of game but while you're in your ship as well, if you've progressed to the point where you've got wingmen, a few fighters under your control, then you can give those wingmen orders while you play as well. Or you can take a step back and look at the strategic overview again, and perhaps even jump into a different ship or give various different orders to any ships that are under your control. So it's got this mix of strategic tactical elements, as well as just having this really fast-paced first-person cockpit-based shooting as well, which is a really interesting side of this game and I've not necessarily seen that exact thing before implemented in this way. Perhaps there are examples of it out there, I'm just not aware of them. And by having this it sort of keeps the variety of ways in which you approach these levels, it mixes them up and it just keeps things quite interesting. Now I believe it's possible to play this game either entirely cockpit based or perhaps even using the strategic, the tactical overview of the level 100% as well. Now I'm not sure of how good the success rate would be by using one or the other and honestly I didn't really experiment by doing that in this game. What I did is you mix things up and you give a few orders at the beginning of the level then you go in and play in a first person shooter style and then perhaps you'll start to give various orders as the levels become more complex as you progress through the campaign you'll find that there are more ships in your fleet at your disposal so you can have things like frigates and destroyers which you have more control over and you need 
need to utilize these in, in ways as the campaign progresses in order to complete the level. So you'll find that you really do need to mix up both sides of this in order to become successful at the, at the game. At least in my experience, I did have to do that. So as you can see from this footage that I'm showing you here, the graphical style is sort of very low poly, but it really looks so clean and sharp in the headset. This is one of the things about this game. Everything just looks so clean and it's got this real polished style to it. And honestly, the graphical style sort of reminds me in some ways of like the, the old Sega 32X games, you know, those low poly 3D games that they had back then. It sort of looks like a few of those games and it just looks fantastic in VR. I've got to say, you know, there's, there's certain graphical styles and you can have these like retro styles that look great in VR. And this is a, another example where these low poly graphics just, just work so well. There's something about it where everything just looks so sharp in the headset with this style. The weapons that you fire, you've got quite a few to choose from. And again, you can upgrade these as you progress through the campaign, but they all feel really solid and the explosions are satisfying as well. But as well, with all of this, the performance is great and the game works fantastically well, even on lower end systems. So you've got this great balance of just this sharp, low poly graphical style, but it, the performance is no problem at all with this game. And you know, it's almost the ideal combination in some ways. Now, part of the reason the explosions are so satisfying is because the sound design is really incredible as well. Now, not only the sound effects of your weapons or the explosions, but you also have this great soundtrack as well, like a pounding soundtrack as you battle in each mission. And it just sets the scene, you know, it creates this whole ambience within this game, which is extremely satisfying as you play through it. As I mentioned before, you know, the game in general is extremely polished. Uh, it's very addictive as well, and it's got an emphasis on replaying missions to complete these sort of bonus challenges, these procedurally generated challenges as well. Now, a lot of the early missions are quite short, but they're very satisfying and they do keep you coming back. The only negatives really with this game is that the campaign is quite short. So you'll probably be able to progress through the campaign within sort of three to four hours, I would say, perhaps even less than that. Um, and the other thing with the game is it's probably lacking overall that extra level of depth, which some people might want. But one of the things that this game does really well is that it's very accessible for new players. So you can learn the ropes very quickly, get into the combat arena, and then sort of progress through at your own pace, really. But it does sort of lack probably some of the more strategic elements that you'll find in a game which is dedicated to that kind of play style. But it's not really a bad thing because it means that you get a little taste of that while also sticking with the this more fast paced first person cockpit shooter side as well. So I really like that balance actually. I think this game does that balance really well. So House of the Dying Sun is available on Steam for £14.99 or $19.99. It's occasionally on sale as well. Um, I don't know how often it appears on sales, honestly, but um, it's probably worth looking out for it. Although I can probably recommend this game at full price anyway, I picked it up for that and I think it's fantastic. So I highly recommend it, honestly. Um, and, you know, if you're into just space games in general, and I cover a lot of space games on this channel, as you've probably seen, and this one ranks really highly up there with alongside many of the others but in a very different way it's more accessible it's perhaps a little bit more lightweight it's very sort of jump in and jump out kind of game it's not got those long form missions of elite dangerous or no man's sky or anything like that but it's but what it does it does fantastically well and i highly recommend this it's strange that this isn't brought up in more conversations but it is an older game now and i can understand why it's perhaps been forgotten but it is a shame because it really does feel great to play so yeah check this one out if you're inclined to do so and let me know what you think and um, but that's pretty much it for this video thank you for watching again and i'll see you next time please consider picking up my science fiction virtual reality focused novel the memory engine a light-hearted tongue-in-cheek adventure through the metaverse available on amazon kindle paperback and as an audible audiobook links in the description to this video